You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with Ryan Biggs and Chris, a.k.a. C.D. Mitchell, from the band Sleep Wraith from Edmonton, Alberta. Their album Day Terrors is out now. You guys, thanks so much for taking time to talk to me, and welcome to The Pit. My thanks. pleasure, man. Thanks for having us. First, we should make sure that people know what your voices can match your voices to who you are. So why don't I get you guys to just say your name and what you play in the band? Uh, Ryan, I play drums and um, the guiro and the <laughs> thunder drum. Hey, I'm Mitchell. I play thring- things with strings and things with chords, like a throat. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. You guys nailed it. So uh, Origins, this is where all the interviews need to begin. How did the band really begin? Because you guys have known each other for a long time, right? Uh, Yeah, man. Since elementary school, basically. Like, uh, we didn't really get to be good friends until we started playing music in our early teens, I guess, and kind of bonded over that. But we knew of each other growing up and stuff. So how did you guys both get started on your respective instruments? Uh, (laughs) I played saxophone in band class (laughs) and at the time I felt it was very uncool, you know, and, uh, so the bass guitar was available in, uh, I think it was grade six or grade seven or something. I took up bass guitar because it was the only guitar that was available in high school band class or junior high band class, I guess. And that kind of got me into that still wasn't as cool as I wanted to be. So (laughs) I took up six string guitar and. That, that's my story anyway. And bought a BC Rich and you never turned back. Never, never turned back, yeah. <laughs> and how about for you, Ryan? How did you get started playing drums? Um, same thing in school, uh, but I never played the sax. I just played uh, the, the percussion and it was like a xylophone and stuff you started with and eventually you could play the drum set. And as soon as I did that one time, I knew that was like, that was the thing. And then uh, I went to a pawn shop and bought a drum set for 500 bucks and... Uh, uh, never looked at another instrument again, <laughs> except the guiro. Yeah. What What is the guiro? I have to ask. It's, it's, um, a, it's like an ethnic, um, like a Latin American instrument that's shaped like a fish and it's made out of wood and it's got little ridges on it. And it's the sound that you hear in the interlude of our song, Anamnesis. I played it in there. It just, it needed something uh, Latin feeling and, the, and there you uh, have it. It needed a guiro. It goes like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great <laughs> <laughs> so you guys uh you first kind of fell in love with grunge music i yeah i think that was just it was mainly a coming of age thing like you know we went from uh whoop, there it is to something with instruments in it <laughs> and uh we were just at that age you know we were at the right age we were in our early teens or whatever for the grunge movement and for me anyway that was the first music i ever heard that kind of tugged on my my soul a little bit like it it kind of made sense teen angst and all that you know but uh yeah it was uh, it was the first music that kind of made us want to start playing music well for me anyway i don't know what and you... plus for grunge music is so like m- well mostly musically basic so when you're just starting out learning on the guitar learning a four chord song is easy learning some basic rock beats is easy that's what nirvana has a lot of that it's not about the technicality but it's a great place to start when you're a, a young musician learning how to play your instrument for the first time yeah yeah. And also the emotional quality behind it, I was going to add, is, it seems like grunge really figured out a way of uh, bringing heavy music and, and an emotional quality behind it that metal kind of had a superficial kind of touch on, but that kind of dug more into it. The songs really tug at your heartstrings. And I hear that in the album. That's awesome. Thanks. Thank That's you. important <laughs> to us. So st- you guys have played with, in lots of different projects together, right? Yeah. Yeah, quite a few. Um, we played in a punk rock band. I so, see, yeah, like, like a straight, straight up skate skater, punk, skater punk, yeah, and, and then, uh, metal core band. And the first band, what was what would you describe that? Yeah, it was, it was kind of kind of hardcore. it was like a mix between grunge and hardcore kind of band. Yeah, this is or, the the most metal we've ever gone. Yeah. Is this project? We we learned how to play our instruments and learned how to be bandmates like together, going from one project to another figuring out how that part works there's playing your instrument and then there's there's being in a band which is like a separate skill all on its own (laughs) yeah so is this the first time you guys have made a complete album just the two of us yeah 
we've made albums before. Yeah. But with other people, but never one, just the two of us. So at some point you guys looked at each other and you said, wouldn't it be cool to make a whole metal album just the way we want to do it? How did that conversation go down? To be honest, it was always kind of there. Like uh, when, when we were, you know, I, what were we, 18 or something? Some, it would have been like 20 years ago ish. Yeah. We, we moved away from our small town, Fort McMurray and into the big city of Edmonton to try to, you know, have a music career. And, uh, we lived in this like tiny little, it didn't even have a bedroom. It was like a little bachelor suite. <laughs> so, I, I slept on the couch and he slept on the floor. Like that's how we first started out in the city and then graduated from that. But anyway, we, we always jammed together and always talked about doing kind of a side project thing. And uh, then when we got kind of tired of uh, playing in bands with all the other things that come with it, all the the workload and stuff. And we just wanted to concentrate on writing music. We thought it was a perfect opportunity to do that thing. We always talked about doing. And so the name sleep Wraith, where did you guys get this name? That's, it's kind of convoluted, but I'll do my best to kind of talk it out. Um, I, I've always felt I was haunted and I think everybody's haunted by, you know, it's always something dark. You're not haunted by good things, but uh, I wanted to try to kind of put a face to it because it's hard to kind of combat something that doesn't have, have a face or a name and uh, decided to call it the sleep wraith. And now we can talk about it, man. Want to talk about it? <laughs> Let's talk. about it. I think that's kind of where it comes from, but I, I never really sat down and thought like, Hey man, what should I say about this question when it comes up? <laughs> so when you guys started sitting down and working on these songs, uh, I'm assuming some of the stuff is new, but there's gotta be some things on here, like, uh, on some of the riffs and like distory go back a long time. You've had them in the bag, right? Wow. Yeah. The history is by far the oldest one. We were jamming probably when we were about 20. So this would have been somewhere around 20 years ago. And this one guy came out, we, we needed a bass player. And I remember while he was there, we were jamming and throwing around riffs. And that started as a beat. And then it was a beat. And then he wrote a, a riff to it. And it did nothing other than exist for this whole time. And then <laughs> this many years later, we were like, what about that riff that we had? And yeah, it ended up becoming that uh, song "Distory." Yeah. Was there an, any other stuff that you guys had like in the bag, or most of this stuff really fresh? Most of it's fresh. Yeah, there were. I'm trying to think of if we did have anything. It was like a little riff that has been rolling around in the back of our heads that we just thought, "Oh, it's in the same key as this song. Maybe we can use it in this kind of part." But I can't really yeah. think of any. And even the "Distory" riff is only one small part. It's maybe like. 30 just the seconds end. or a minute or yeah, something. Yeah, the the intro kind of thing. It seems it seems like for a guitar player, it's it's easier to kind of create a, a bag of riffs that you can kind of carry around forever. But as a drummer, did, did Ryan, when you approached the music, was everything fresh? Writing the drum parts to the songs, or was there anything that you had in the bag as well? Just that distry part, because that distry part started as a beat. But uh, no, but it, it's writing get uh, drums is easy when you have a, a guitarist that has that does so much rhythm. If, if you got a guy that's giving you like like four chords, na 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 like that, like it's hard to come up with clever original sort of stuff all the time. But when when the guitar riff is like or something like that, then it gives you something to play off. I'm glad you're recording this. We're gonna yeah. use we're gonna use that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a Ryan Biggs original, and that's basically our creative process is just doing that at each other. What if it went? how we communicate you guys are usually in the room together then you don't like to go off and kind of to your separate corners and meet up with finished ideas uh well yes and no like nothing's ever finished until we're both right satisfied with it but uh, we do split off quite a bit um we we come up with like the rhythm guitars and like a, a basic kind of drum outline and then, well, it's not even basic. We go pretty hard on writing all the rhythm stuff. And then we do like a kind of shitty home recording of it just so I can write the, the bass and the vocals to it because the music always kind of changes a little bit once you get vocals invo involved, other instruments and stuff. And 
then we sit with it again with the like the other instruments in it basically and then pick the living shit out of it until it is perfect to us <laughs> and we do that's all definitely teamwork and uh, part of this process, it seems like a lot of people are using computers nowadays, writing stuff into Guitar Pro and stuff. Do you guys ever like to write anything down like that way? Or do you just record it all and just kind of remember it on your instruments? Um, I do. I use that for, for drums, not Guitar Pro, but I, I do a, a thing where I can save like drum beat ideas by writing them into a thing. And then I just like I record them later. But uh, that's a really like neat way to record like uh, drum ideas. I highly recommend it to anybody. It's one of the like the big benefits I got out of going to band class is being able to read and write drum music, which is actually not that that hard compared to like noted instruments. But it comes in really handy when you want to jot down ideas and stuff. If you don't know how to read and write music, you can record them with your phone or your GoPro while you play them, but you can't really write them down. And that's right. kind of awesome too, because it, it extends your physical memory. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then you don't have to think about it. You just come back to it later and be like, oh man, yeah, that was cool. Let's get into lyrics. Because, you know, it's always fun to talk about lyrics. Yeah. Uh, Chris, are these ma- mainly you behind all the lyrics? Uh, yeah, and the ghost. Right. Right. Mainly the, the other ghost. side. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So <clears throat> is this your first time doing vocals? No, uh, no. Okay. I had to think about it for a sec, but no, I put out an, like a little solo album when I was in my twenties and did vocals throughout all of the other bands that we were in, but it was always shared, shared space. Okay. I'm going to pause the interview right here. I just wanted to point out to anyone who's listening to this interview, why I started going grilling Chris on his vocals here, asking them if this was the first album he'd done vocals on is if you listen to this album, it's amazing how the vocals are. It, I actually thought there was like two, maybe even three different vocalists on this album. And when I found out that it was all just Chris doing it himself, it blew me away. This is not the work of a vocalist doing a debut album. This is the sound of a vocalist who has had a lot of experience finding their voice. He's got a lot of different tonalities of screams. He's got the low guttural stuff like Death Clock. He's got the mid-range. He's got the high-range screams and the clean vocals. So... Yeah, he absolutely fucking killed it with the vocals. All right, back to the interview. Yeah. Well, geez. I don't know how you managed to do it. It was from, like, each song has kind of its own feeling. Like, it seems like you guys really wanted to explore different, like, moods of metal. And so it's not like you've gone off and become a different band from each song to song. It still sounds like Sleep Wraith, but it's like you guys wanted to really explore a lot of different flavors. Oh, thank you. And I, that's such a profound compliment. That's exactly what we were, like, aiming for. I'm glad you, that that comes through. That's kind of the most important thing to us, having uh, storytelling and dynamic parts and stuff. Like, I listen to a lot of death metal, but I find if everything is a climax, nothing is a climax. <laughs> so I, for us, I think we need the ups and downs, and it's easier to uh, paint moods and paint pictures with it that way. And, and same thing with the lyrics, too. Is like There's certain moments in the lyrics where... Uh, I, I wouldn't know that I wouldn't, I don't know what the, what the word means. I would need to get out of the thesaurus. And then there's other times <laughs> when you say things like give a fuck, you know? And so it's kind of like this, you got both worlds. It's like, you got the really eloquent, uh, you know, big fancy words. And then you also have things like give a fuck. <laughs> it's, uh, it's two different parts of a broken mind. <laughs> two, yeah. Two different singers, the left brain and the right. Yeah. So now let's talk about the artwork. This is uh, Therese Lands. Yeah, Therese Lands. Yeah, Therese. I wasn't sure how to say their first name. And so, how did, how did you discover them, or did they discover you? Uh, she was a friend on our Facebook or on my Facebook or something, just through music. She used to play in a band called Mares of Thrace. I think they were called. She was the front person of that band, and. You know, that's what Facebook is. You see somebody with a guitar and you befriend them because however long Facebook, when did it start? I don't even remember. But way back then, you just like-minded people became your friends and you see things they post. And she works for a video game software company doing design stuff. And I just thought, hey, I got this idea. Let's see if she'd be interested in doing it. So we kind of hired her on to do a a t-shirt for us. And... uh, You can check it out at (laughs) sleepwraith.com. But uh, yeah, she did the t-shirt design, the the colorful one. 
with the person in the bed and stuff. And we were like, man, this is awesome. So we decided to contact her again for the album artwork and work with her on the concepts, give her concepts basically, and say, we're kind of going for this, take a run at it. And she nailed it. Like she was awesome. Just nailed it. Absolutely. This is one of those albums that I definitely recommend anyone to get the physical copy, like the digital copy, you're going to get the music, but the physical copy with the artwork, it just really brings you further into your guys' imagination. What, but I need to ask more about the artwork too, is like you obviously had some say and some, uh, in it, what the heart seems to be a kind of thing that keeps coming back in like a symbol. Yeah. Does it, what can I ask about about that? (laughs) It kind of symbolizes truth. I guess like um, it's the one it's kind of used in those pictures, like the one light, I guess, like we're not religious or anything. So I don't want people to think it's got anything to do with that, but like you've got your, your good and your bad and your middle part who is essentially you in your, in your core. And that's what we kind of used throughout the artwork to, you could like, it gets a little darker, the heart, And then it gets sucked right out and then it's kind of alive again in rebirth. Ah, so it's about rebirth, about, uh, especially like this whole album, it's sort of a concept album is, is following one character, right? Uh, it, it started that way, but it's, I don't know. My, my brain doesn't work that way. I wasn't able to stay on track. So every track's (laughs) got like kind of like the overarching concept is day terrors. It's things that, people are dealing with whether it's, you know, mental illness or addiction or grief or any, anything like that. Like every song has got a bit of a, well, actually there's one song that's actually about the psychopathy of murder, (laughs) (laughs) but you have to put one of those on a metal record, you know? Absolutely. But yeah, (laughs) the songs are all a little different, but the overarching theme is uh, people struggling with their own ghosts and their day terrors. So you guys kind of, like you said, the things really started for you when you moved to Edmonton, eh? Edmonton's got a crazy scene. There's so many metal bands in that city. It's kind of nuts how many I've discovered (laughs) just in the last year. Uh, What do you think it is that attracts people to this this city? Like, is it kind of like the venues? Definitely not. There's hardly any venues, even before COVID. But I would say that it's not there's so many metal bands. There's a lot of metal musicians, and they all um, spend time with each other going, doing rounds with different people coming like, because we know lots of musicians that have been in 50 different bands, right? Yeah. And uh, th- there are venues and there is a scene. But I just think that uh, like if you're into metal and you live in Alberta, there's no metal scene anywhere except in really in Edmonton. Uh, there's probably one in Calgary, too, at least to some point. But the c- country is a lot bigger down there. Um, so I, I don't know, compared to Vancouver, Edmonton scene is, is probably 10% of what you got in Vancouver. Every time I go there, I'm blown away by the amount of, of great bands, not just number of bands, but really, really good bands. And uh, Edmonton has a scene, but it's, I don't know, I'd say it's pretty, pretty light compared to Vancouver. Especially today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think part of it too is uh, like s- playing with bands who are really good make you a better player and you like so if you have one metal band in the city that's really really awesome and like we've had lots of great metal come out of Edmonton a lot of people looked up to that and aspired to that and uh, I think it just keeps driving that that force and there becomes more and better and more and better and more and better within you know a certain community or something I'm just kind of speculating but makes sense in my head (laughs) That makes sense to me too. Uh, and of course, uh, <clears throat> so the thing that happened to the world that we don't talk about happened and, uh, you guys have already released your album day terrors before that. I imagine that once that album got released, did you already just think, okay, let's go back to the drawing board and start working on the next one. Was it like just right away or did you t- kind of take a bit of time to enjoy the release? <laughs> Is, yeah. he, is he talking about Voldemort? Voldemort. You're not supposed to say that name. Oh, shit. <laughs> ah, and I said shit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we took a bit of a break, mostly because, uh, like, it was really intense, like, doing the recording and stuff, and uh, intense leading up to it. Like, we practiced 
so much, man. Like I, I can't even put a number on it. Probably like 20 hours a week of full on giving her beans and then got to the studio and did that all through the studio. And then it was like trying to do some PR stuff, like working with um, John Asher. And uh, yeah, we wanted to just sit back. I think we did for maybe like a month and a half. And then it was like, okay, man, let's start writing songs again. Cause that's what we love to do. <laughs> and plus when the quarantine thing happened at first, everybody was like, I don't know about you. Uh, I was just at home and I never left the house. And neither did Chris. So yeah. like until people kind of got to at least he's still like uh, he's he's part of my house unit, I guess. He's, he's like my one person I'm allowed to have over. That's not my wife. <laughs> yeah. And we don't even jam in the same room. Technically, there's a he's in the, the drum room, the studio room, and I'm hanging out in the undrywalled basement all by myself. Yeah. <laughs> But at least you guys are able to do that instead of going over the internet where you got all the leg and every all those issues. Yeah, it would definitely I, I think we're kind of lucky that there's only two of us, to be honest, in yeah. that respect. And I don't know how, how effective we would be at writing and that like some people are great at that. As long as you have an internet connection, they can make an album without without ever being in the same room. But I don't think that that would work for us. It, but uh, so, yeah, when you guys started working on stuff like in quarantine now, do you guys find it hard to be creative or have you had just an explosion of ideas? Personally, I've um, I keep a lot of time to myself and kind of like it. So I don't think anything really changed other than I had less obligations and <laughs> more time to sit at home and play guitar. Yeah, it, it, the, I would say how productive we are is, is more of a matter of how we're feeling that day than how we are feeling like this month or something. We always got riffs to work on and stuff. But if I'm real tired, he's real tired. The jam is less productive, but it's, it's all based on the day. We're chugging along forward, making, I think, really good progress on this new album. Yeah. I think it's smart, too, to also not try to force yourself to spit something out. I mean, if, if you don't feel the muse, then just work on something else, right? You guys are trying to make art that you're actually proud of. You're not making a product to sell so many CDs and blah, blah, blah. That's exactly it, man. You nailed it. Like, yeah, we, we are, we're doing it for the art and not for the coin. We are, we're not trying to run a business with it. And I, that's a benefit to us because then we can be true to the picture. Yeah. The whole point of, uh, of, of recording it really well and making the CD with all the art and that is just so that we can make a thing that then exists in the world and will never unexist because it's digital, you know? So absolutely long after we're gone, the, the album exists. So, you know, we've, it's like we've left a mark, even if very few people have, uh, have, have heard it, it's still, mm -hmm. we did it for us and we love it. So what advice would you guys give to someone who's trying to achieve their dreams? Don't sacrifice them for money. <laughs> yeah. It depends on the dream. If your dream's to get rich, then by all means. But if the dream is to write an album that you think is just dope AF, um, do that and don't be concerned with, you know, the cost and don't be concerned with whether you think you're going to make your money back on it. Cause you, your original goal wasn't to do that. Yeah. If it comes to, I can't tell somebody about their dreams in general, but if it's about music, you, your dream is related to music, then figure out what, what role you want it to play in your life now when you're like 15 or whatever. And then, and then follow people that are doing that. I, I, I know a million musicians and I only know one that does it for a living. And uh, he's actually like a guitarist and that's, that's what he does. And if you want to do it for a living, surround yourself with people like that, learn from them because it's a totally different thing than doing what we're doing. Chris and I both have jobs and careers that we use to support music as a, as a hobby. It's never been my, my job and I'm okay with that. I love that, 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 you know, I have this as a thing that I, I do because I want to, not because I have to. And uh, so figure out what you want now and then figure out where, how, how long it's going to take you to get there and then work towards that. Is there anything else that you guys would like to say to our listeners? Thank you for checking out our music. It's, uh, it's for us, but it's also for everybody. And if you got anything out of it, then I, I appreciate that, that you, you listened to it and absorbed it the way that like, we put it out. And uh, thank you for that. I can't say anything more than that. It was, yeah, it was beautiful. I'm going to cry. Yeah. <laughs> I thought maybe we should also give a shout out to Terry 
the producer. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That guy is just the best. Nothing but great things to say about him. He's he's good. He uh, I, I had questions when we first started hanging out with him because he told us that he didn't have a lot of experience with metal. And then you listen to this album, and I would never guess that he didn't have a lot of experience with metal. He is a very skilled, uh, like, uh, you know, engineer and and just everything audio, very uh, intelligent, professional, good at what he does, for sure. For sure. And we were sad when the recording ended, because now it's like, hey, man, we, we're not going to see you for a while. S- <laughs> see you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, he became a really good friend of ours and a, like, of course, a crucial role in the recording of it, but also he was our third member for while we were recording the album. So thanks, Terry. You rock, man. Yeah. Can I uh, also ask just, uh, just how are you guys coming with any new material right now? Can you say or do you not want to let the cat out of the bag? No, we're happy to. Um, we take a long time to write. So, you know, it's going to be a, a bit maybe by the end. I don't know. I don't want to say anything, but um I'm looking at our board here. We've got five songs that we're currently working on. And in those songs, we're just basically building like the rhythm and drums, rhythm, guitar and drums skeletons for them. So I think once we kind of nail those, we're going to record them and then write the other parts and do that thing I was talking about, kind of iron them out and see what happens. I, I'd like to, we're, we're not sure if we're going to release an EP or a full length, but I love the idea of releasing another full length, but that takes time. It also speeds up as we go. Once we get more into the, into the, the whole mojo of just writing and writing and writing, the songs seem to flow faster. At least they did on the other album. Yeah. So yeah, that's true. You've been listening to the peach pit. I've been talking to Chris and Ryan from the band sleep Wraith. Their album day terrors is out now. So go check it out. You guys, thanks for taking time to talk to me and hopefully we'll do it again in the future. Definitely will, man. Thanks a lot. Yep. Thank you.